We now have all the primary tools in place so we can discuss how to do classical control design. So again, we have our feedback connection from a reference input uh, to a measured output. Um, and we've uh, seen in a previous lecture uh, that we can denote the transfer function of the closed loop system, which we denote T of S, uh, which is Y of S over R of S. as simply g of s d of s over 1 plus g of s d of s. And to simplify the discussion, we often identify L of s as g of s d of s. And so we think, can then just write uh, this as L of s over 1 plus L of s. And further, if L of s is k times b of s over a of s, then we can write this after clearing the compound fraction simply as k times b of s over a of s plus k times b of s. Or alternatively, dividing the numerator and the denominator by k as b of s over a of s over k plus b of s. So with this understanding of what the closed loop is, the, the, the closed loop transfer function is, um, with our knowledge of the subject of signals and systems, we can take the step response of t of s. And so we can characterize what it behaves like. And what we'd, we're looking for is a step response that's like this pink line. And so if we put in a unit step, we'll get out some step that actually has a, a finite rise time. And so the time that it takes to go from point 0.1 to point 0.9 of the final value is denoted the, the rise time. It'll overshoot perhaps the, uh, the, the desired target a little bit, so we'll call MP the percent overshoot. And it will take a while to settle within an envelope uh, that's plus or minus 5% of the final value, and so we'll denote that the settling time. So we've identified typical characteristics of a step response as being the rise time, the settling time, and the overshoot. Also, we can take a Bode plot of T of S, and so this, since this is the transfer function of the closed loop system, we can call that the closed loop Bode plot. And so we take uh, the, the Bode plot of that system, and it often behaves, if we have designed our, our system well, um, it often behaves kind of like a low pass filter. So at low frequencies, we have good tracking, which means that if we put in uh, R of T, which is a sign of omega T for omega small, uh, then at low omega, um, the magnitude of T is 1 and the phase of T is 0, meaning T is acting essentially like 1, meaning for low frequency excita excitations, the output of the, the system is, again, a sinusoid um, at the same frequency, at about the same magnitude um, and about the same phase. Um, whereas at higher frequencies, we'll see that um, typically after we've designed our, our closed loop system well, uh, the magnitude of, of the system begins to trail off. And so in a Bode plot of the closed loop system like this, we can characterize a couple of features. For instance, we can take a look at the frequency after which the magnitude drops below a value of 0.7, so this would be log of 0.7 on, on this axis, uh, and so after it drops below that value of, of 0.7, we call that the bandwidth frequency, omega BW. Um, and we can also look before that frequency where it drops off, um, we can take a look at um, one or more frequencies. We might see a peak in the response, um, and we refer to those as resonances. And so we can look them at the magnitude of those resonances um, and the frequencies at which those resonances occur. And Resonances can generally be harmful if you uh, have certain frequencies at which the output of the system is large. Um, certainly that can cause a behavior and uh, a failure in engineering systems. So we want to make sure that as we close the control loop, uh, we don't excite any bad resonances. And so we can check both the step response and the closed loop Bode plot once we have 
uh, proposed a D of S in order to see how well we've done. So now we know enough, based on our previous discussions, uh, to discuss the, the primary tools that we will use to design the D of S in order to achieve a response of this sort. And the first tool that we use is the root locus plot. So we've already discussed the root locus plot some, but just to recap, the root locus plot uh, is the plot of where the closed loop poles, that is the poles of T of S, move um, as you take a parameter, and typically we're, we're studying uh, as, as you move the parameter k um, from a small value to a large value. So uh, when k is small, we can look right here, when k is small, the poles of T of S are very near those values of zero that make A of S go to zero, because when k is, k is small, uh, this term is about zero. Um, and so for small k, the poles of the closed loop system are very near the poles of the open loop system, the values of S that make A of S go to zero. And for large K, as we can crank K up to larger and larger values, um, we see that for large K, this term is negligible, so the denominator of this gets closer and closer to B of S, so we see that the poles of the closed loop system, T of S, um, are moving closer and closer towards the values of S that make B of S go to zero, um, which are exactly the zeros of the open loop system. So as we discussed in a previous lecture, um, or, or our closed loop poles move from the open loop poles to the open loop zeros. And if there are more poles than there are zeros um, in our closed loop transfer function, which is typical, um, then those extra zeros are effectively at the point at infinity. Um, and so um, we've learned the, uh, uh, the arguments for and, and the, uh, the, the rules for plotting um, the uh, root locus plot um, as you can't crank k from small to large um, as the um, for, for problems where you have more poles than zeros, um, or for problems where you have uh, the same number of poles and zeros. And so for this case, we have a simple 1 over s squared plant. So our g of s is 1 over s squared, and our d is simply k. Um, and uh, we see that as we crank the, the k from small to large, the closed loop poles are on the imaginary axis. So if we pick some intermediate value of k, we're going to have a closed loop pole, say, there and there. and um, so the system is going to be neutrally stable. For any value of k, we don't have the poles in the left half plane. So we don't achieve stability for this plant with this design. So the first thing that we can do is we can ask ourselves, so if we select a D of S um, is, uh, as perhaps the, the product of several components, uh, maybe our D of S will have an overall gain k um, times another term, which we're going to call uh, a lead compensator. And a lead compensator um, is going to put a uh, zero here and a pole there. And so now we have uh, our D of S has some dynamics. Um, and so it has a, uh, our, our D of S for a lead compensator. Um, has uh, S plus C over S plus P, where the, um, the zero is slower than the pole, um, so the zero is less than the P. And so now if we draw our closed loop uh, or our uh, root locus uh, for this system that now has a D of S uh, that has the um, pole and zero in that location, then we'll have a branch of the locus that goes from the x to the o um, right there. And the effect of that on the, the rest of this locus is going to swing the locus um, off into the left half plane a little bit. And so now if we pick some intermediate value of k, we'll get the um, closed loop poles all on the left half plane. Um, and so then we will have stabilized our system. And so um, we can look at the, uh, the root locus plot and propose a controller, in this case it's fairly straightforward, to propose a controller that pulls the locus into the left half plane. Then we go back to our subject of signals and systems um, and we say, okay, if we only had two closed loop poles, so if the re behavior of the system was dominated by just a complex conjugate pair of, of closed loop poles, I have some ideas of where those poles may lie in order to reach 
the uh, step response characteristics of interest. So for instance, if I have a constraint on what I'm looking for for the rise time, uh, then I'll know that the distance from the origin where I want those poles to lie um, should be, uh, which I denote omega n, uh, should be at least 1.8 over that rise time. If I know uh, some idea of how long I, I want for the, the system to settle, so I want the system to settle within a certain amount of time Ts, um, then I know that the closed loop poles should be to the left of the imaginary axis by at least a certain amount, um, which again a rule of thumb is 4.6 over that settling time. And so that gives us an idea of how far we should push those poles to the left. And further, if I have an idea of the overshoot that I'm looking for, then a 15% overshoot uh, relates to uh, a zeta of about 0.5, a 5% overshoot relates to a zeta of about 0.7, where the zeta in turn is the sign of this angle theta, which is the angle between the imaginary axis and where your poles are. So that angle is theta. Uh, and so um, from an overshoot constraint, <laughs> between 5 and 15 percent or greater, you can kind of extrapolate from there, you can get an idea of the angle into the left half plane um, that you want those poles to lie. So those rough second order design guides give you an idea um, of where acceptable pole locations are. Um, and then if you use a simple compensator like this one that we described there, um, then uh, we can swing those poles into the left half plane to meet those design guides. Now again, these design guides are uh, accurate only for systems which are dominated by second order behavior. And in this particular case, we have three poles, uh, three closed loop poles. And so that third pole um, causes a bit of extra overshoot. Um, so um, a bit of extra overshoot is caused by that uh, third pole in this case. And so we'll uh, typically have to increase the damping a little more than predicted by these uh, uh, approximate design guides um, in order to, uh, to, to bring the step response down to what we're looking for. So we can get in the ballpark of the response that we're looking for uh, by using uh, the um, approximate second order design guides and uh, our, our ability to sketch root locus plots um, when we put in some simple compensation like that. So this again gets us stability and gets us in the ballpark of a, uh, of a step response that, that might be what we're looking for. The next thing that we do is we take a look at the Bode plot not of the closed loop system that we're interested in, T of S, which is what I would call what we do as a final check. If I have a D of S, here's how we check it and make sure the response of the system meets rise time, settling time, overshoot, bandwidth constraints, doesn't have too uh, big resonances, etc. So those are the final checks that we uh, that we can uh, that we can perform, um, and they use the tools that we saw in the uh, the subject of sig signals and systems, the the process of drawing a step response of T of S and calculating a Bode plot of T of S. Um, so those are those checks are straightforward to do, um, but. Uh, if we want to tune the behavior more precisely to get uh, exactly uh, or, or as, uh, as well as we can the, the uh, specs on the performance that we're looking for, instead of fiddling further in the root locus plot, we can make a much more targeted controller design um, if we look at the Bode plot of L. So we're doing the Bode plot here of uh, L of I, of I omega, and uh, so that's the um, log of the magnitude and the phase of um, G of I omega times D of I omega, which we're denoting here simply as L of I omega. Um, and uh, so for our uh, starting point, our one over S squared plant, um, the magnitude on the, uh, the Bode plot uh, of, of our system goes down by a slope of negative two on the log log plot. And uh, again, if you're an electrical engineer and like to plot things in decibels, you'd put a factor of 20 here. And so um, this would go down at a, a slope of minus 40 if you have a 1 over S squared behavior, or at a slope of minus 20 if you have a, of a 1 over S behavior. So in this case, it would be a, a slope of minus 40 um, on a decibel plot. But in, in this work, we're going to uh, keep everything just as a log log plot on our Bode plot. So this will be a slope of minus 2. Um, and the phase 
So 1 over s squared times k um, uh, is the, the, the phase of that um, is uh, minus 180 degrees plus, again, any multiple of 360 um, for any uh, frequency that we're looking at here. So the phase is minus 180 degrees, and the slope um, goes down at uh, uh, a slope of minus 2 um, on the magnitude part. And so that's what the Bode plot of um, our plant looks like. And then when we add proportional control, so if our d of s were simply k, that would just lift this up a little bit and would leave the phase uh, alone. So if k was greater than 1, we, we'd just be lifting that line up. If k was less than 1, then we'd just lift, be lifting that down when we plot the, the, the Bode plot of L. Remember, L is uh, g of s times d of s. So right here we have the Bode plot of, of g of s. If we add a d of s is equal to k, we'd just be shifting that line up or down a little bit, uh, depending upon the magnitude of k. So now, um, if we add uh, different components to that, um, we can um, shape what's going on in the, uh, in the space here. And typically, there are um, three components that we'll look at. Um, and uh, so we can look at lead compensation, we can look at lag compensation, and uh, we can look at uh, a low-pass filter. Let's call it a low-pass filter. And so um, a lag compensation is going to be a, a compensator which, with, which has a similar form as this. Um, so d of s as a lag compensator um, is just s plus z over s plus p where z is greater than p. And uh, a low-pass filter, we saw in the subject of signals and systems, uh, a low-pass filter, uh, you can write a first-order one or a second-order one or even higher-order ones. Um, but a low-pass filter uh, is a, a filter that is nearly one for frequencies that are um, below some, some cutoff frequency. Uh, and then uh, decay um, as frequencies um, go, go larger. So a simple first order low pass filter, for instance, um, could be, let's call it um, omega naught um, over um, s plus omega naught. And so plugging in s is equal to i omega for very small values of omega, this is acting like 1. For, omega, for values of omega significantly larger than omega naught, um, this thing is dropping off like 1 over s. Um, and so this is a low pass filter. Um, and so um, we can look at a plot like this and we can um, say, okay, what do we want the shape of this Bode plot to look like in order to get good characteristics on the um, step response and the Bode plot uh, and, uh, and to get, get the response that we're looking for. So let's first think about the low frequency behavior. Again, at low frequencies, we want to be able to track. So if I put in a sinusoid, a low frequency sinusoid for R, I get a low frequency sinusoid for, for Y um, that has the same magnitude uh, and the same phase. So the, the gain being 1 uh, and the magnitude being 0. And so um, coming back to uh, T of S being L of s over 1 plus L of s, how do we get that to be nearly 1? Well, we can get that to be nearly 1 if L of s is very, very large, and I don't care the, the phase. As long as the magnitude of L of s is very large, like say 1,000, then T of s is like 1,000 over 1,001, and that's very close to 1, regardless of what to, precisely the phase is um, of L of s. Um, and uh, so if you have L of s, the magnitude of that is say 1,000, uh, then you would have 0.1% tracking, uh, because this would be very close to 0 0.001. 1,000 uh, over 1,001 is 1.001. So you'd, we'd have about 0.1% um, uh, error um, for a, a value of L that was about 1,000 at low frequencies. So, so here I, I marked, uh, if we have a tracking constraint, uh, which is in, say, um, plus or minus 1%, we'd need L to be about uh, a, a magnitude of, of about 100. So we'd have something as about 100 over 101, uh, which is, uh, which is um, very close to 1. Um, that would be uh, what, about 0.99. Um, and so, uh, so that would give you um, tracking to within plus or minus 1%. So instead of being a value of 0 there, it would be 1% be off of it. So it would be um, very accurate tracking, but not perfect tracking um, as, uh, for, for, for low frequencies. Some plants 
will actually go all the way up to infinity like this one over s squared plant. So at low frequencies, um, this will be exactly uh, exactly zero on a log plot or, or the, the magnitude will exactly be one um, because the plant itself is going to infinity at low frequencies. Uh, but it might come down and we still want to track at, at higher frequencies and so we might want to um, bump the phase up um, over these low frequency ranges and so we get better free, better tracking at these intermediate frequencies and so we can do that with lag compensation and uh, lag compensators like this um, and so that's a way to, to bump up um, the low frequency gain uh, in order to get better tracking at low frequencies. So our tracking constraint, at low frequencies we want the response to be big um, and so we get good tracking. And so we often draw a little shaded out region here. It's like, okay, I don't want the response to be like that. I need to boost up the um, gain of the system at low frequencies in order to get good uh, low frequency tracking. Conversely, at high frequencies, um, you'll typically want to um, suppress the behavior of the system. Um, and so you can accomplish that um, with lead compensation. Um, and so if you develop a lead compensator um, and uh, center it in the frequency domain so that uh, so it uh, is, is um, acting on the system primarily over here, um, then you can um, push down, sorry, Once you have the low frequencies taken care of, you can also take a look at the high frequencies. And generally you want to suppress the response of your system at high frequencies uh, because uh, the excitation of the high frequencies uh, is generally just due to noise um, and you don't want to burn up your actuators chasing noise around. And so you can use uh, low pass filtering uh, to um, suppress the response of the system even more than the uh, system responds already uh, if it might be coming down already but you might want to push it down a little bit more by adding some low pass filtering at the high frequencies. And so we'll center our lag compensation in order to boost the gain up at low frequencies so we can get good tracking and we'll apply low pass filtering at high frequencies in order to set, suppress the response of the system at high frequencies. And so this will um, suppress the ability to track uh, the, the reference input with the measured output at high frequencies, so we're not going to be able to track as well there. But the other sensitivities, which we discussed in a previous lecture, um, will be suppressed as we um, design a D of S which has a low gain at high frequencies. And so, um, for instance, the uh, control input to the system will respond less to the variance disturbance inputs um, if we make D small for high frequencies. And so that's why we apply low pass frequency low pass filtering um, at high frequencies and then finally we need to figure out something special to do in the middle and uh, we've already argued that um, some lead compensation so a compensator compensator that looks something like this about at the frequency range of interest is useful for as we look at the root locus plot shifting the closed loop pulls over into the left half plane. So this branch of the root locus shifts into the left as I add this new branch associated with the lead compensator. So let's take a look at how that, uh, that works right here. Um, and so to understand why we have something special going on here, again, let's make the argument that at low frequencies, the gain is big, and at high frequencies, the gain is small. So there's some special value of the frequency, which, uh, which let's indicate here um, as omega c, the crossover frequency. And at that special value of the frequency, the um, 
the, the magnitude is 1, or the log of the magnitude is 0. There's something special that goes on at that frequency, and we care about the phase at that frequency. So understanding that is fundamental to seeing why the open loop Bode plot is very useful um, for tuning D of S in order to get a closed loop behavior that you're looking for. Um, so let's take a, uh, a more careful look. So we have our T of S um, is um, L of S over 1 plus L of S. Um, and so what are the values of S that give us closed loop poles? Those are the values of S that make the denominator of this thing go to zero. So we're looking for um, for the S that make the denominator go to zero, those are the closed loop poles. So let's take a look on the, um, at the situation of what happens if we are on the verge of instability. So if we're on the verge of instability, we've got closed loop poles on the imaginary axis. If we've got poles on the imaginary axis, then any slight change to the system and those poles go into the right half plane and we're unstable. So that's on the verge of instability and we want to, in some sense, measure the distance away from that condition that we're at. Um, and so if we have um, S is equal to I omega and we take a look at T of I omega is equal to L of I omega over 1 plus L of I omega. I say uh, closed loop pole at um, S is equal to I omega is given by 1 plus L of I omega equals 0. Or in other words, L of I omega is equal to minus 1. That's the critical condition. Right? If we have a value of omega such that L of I omega is equal to negative 1, then that value of, of S, for S is equal to I omega, makes the denominator goes, go to 0, which means we have closed loop poles at that frequency on the imaginary axis. And that's a problem. We're on the verge of instability. So again, let's take a careful look at what this means. If L of I omega equals minus 1, that is equivalent to saying that the magnitude of L of I omega is equal to 1 for the same frequency that the phase of L of I omega um, is equal to minus 180 degrees plus any multiple of 360 that you like. And so at the same frequency, so these two things together. So if we have those two things together, that's the same as saying there's an omega such that L of I omega is equal to negative 1. That means we have a pole on the imaginary axis, and that's a problem. So let's take a look if we have that in this situation uh, denoted by the yellow here, which corresponds to, as we already saw in the root locus plot, that corresponds to being on the verge of instability. So let's see, see what happens here. We have the magnitude is large on this side and small on this side, so it's got to cross one somewhere. Let's say it crosses at this frequency uh, that we call the crossover frequency, omega c. And let's come down from there and take a look at what the corresponding frequency. And sure enough, the corresponding frequency there, where the magnitude is equal to 1, has the phase is equal to minus 180 degrees. So we see on the Bode plot, we're on the verge of instability. So what we need is to make a bump in the phase to get the phase away from this critical value of 180 degrees um, at the frequency that the magnitude goes through 1. We know the magnitude is going to go through 1 somewhere because it's big over here, small over here. It's going to go through 1 somewhere. So we've got to work to get the phase away from 180 degrees um, at that frequency. And so what we need to do is we need to put a bump up in the phase at that frequency uh, in order to um, have this not satisfied. So where the magnitude is equal to 1, we need the phase to be away from 180 degrees. Um, and so we call this distance, so this distance here, um, the phase margin, which is, if you like, the amount of 
slop that you can have in your system uh, before you're on the verge of instability. So say you've modeled in your plant, you've modeled the gain exactly right, but there are some phase losses that you haven't accounted for. How much phase loss can you afford to have in your problem at this frequency before you reach the verge of instability is exactly this measure called the phase margin. And so um, we want to make sure that that phase margin gives us enough room that we can have a little bit of wiggle room um, and still make sure that um, if we have errors in our modeling of the phase of the problem, um, we're still stable. Similarly, there's another measure called the gain margin. Um, and so if we have a problem um, where the phase, say, um, uh, crosses the 180 degree line, uh, then what we can do is we can go up and we can look at um, the frequency that that happens and say, okay, um, what is the magnitude there? And so um, we'll call this uh, measure the gain margin. And so if we have, um, say, a uh, um, a factor of, let, let's say our, our gain is 0.1 at this point, then we'll say our gain margin is 10. That means we have a factor of 10 in the gain um, that, uh, that we can uh, allow to happen before we have this condition, we're on the verge of stability, if, uh, of instability, if we modeled the phase right. So again, if we got the modeling of the phase right, we're saying, okay, how much modeling of the, the, the gain can we tolerate before we get to the verge of instability, uh, we can uh, figure that out by looking at the gain margin. Um, in some Bode plots, um, the, the phase actually doesn't cross the 180 degree line, um, and so then the, the gain margin is infinite. Uh, but for many problems it does, and so we can identify both a phase margin and a gain margin, which to begin with are, are just um, measures of, of how much error in your modeling of your system you can afford to have uh, before uh, you reach the verge of instability given by this condition or alternatively these two conditions um, at the same omega. Um, and so, uh, so we want that number um, to be uh, well away from, uh, f from one um, and we want this phase margin to be well away from zero uh, in order to assure we have sufficient wiggle room there. Now the final thing that we can notice is that based on uh, the characterizations that we've seen here, um, there is, uh, uh, th there are some um, approximate design guides um, that we can uh, turn to uh, in order to, uh, to, to say, okay, where exactly should I adjust this crossover frequency? Um, and again, when somebody gives you a, a starting problem, they say, okay, I'd like your closed-loop step response and your Bode plot of your closed-loop system uh, to look like, say, this. They might specify uh, one or more of, of, of these conditions, like the rise time or maybe the bandwidth constraint. Um, and so if somebody gives you a rise time constraint, um, it is a rule of thumb that is often fairly accurate. Um, that if somebody gives you a rise time constraint, you need the, cross, the crossover frequency here uh, to be greater than uh, about 1.8 over the rise time. And so that tells you where you should um, make your target crossover frequency um, so, so you can plan while you start this control design. So building the controller D of S, you can say, okay, by the time I finish this whole thing, I'm going to adjust the K so that I actually get crossover at that frequency. And so the first thing that you do when you're trying to design this D of S is based on a rise time constraint, um, you mark, okay, this is going to be my target crossover frequency, and you design around that. And then the final step um, is to adjust the case so you actually get crossover at that frequency. And in the, in the interim, um, you're going to design these other components. So you're going to design some lag compensation to boost up the gain at low frequencies. You're going to design some low pass filtering. So uh, let's call this um, low pass filtering. in order to push down the response of the system at, uh, um, at high frequencies. And you're going to design some lead compensation uh, in order to give you a bump up in the phase at the frequency that you're designing for crossover. And then once you have all of those pieces in place and you get the shape of this right, uh, then you adjust the overall K to get crossover there. Um, that process is called loop shaping. and provides a very precise and targeted way of 
designing controllers um, that do just what you need at low frequencies and high frequencies and at intermediate frequencies and no more in order to uh, push the system as gently as possible to achieve the rise time, the settling time, and the overshoot constraints and the bandwidth constraints. And so what this process is, is quite iterative. And so it's a design process um, and uh, two different uh, control designers will always come up with two different controllers uh, because they follow through this process slightly differently, that's fine. It's a design. Um, and again, uh, you start with um, constraints on rise time, settling time, overshoot, uh, bandwidth constraints, and, and uh, resonant peaks. And then uh, given a set of constraints like that, you first go over to your root locus plot, draw the root locus plot of G of S, uh, and you see where the closed loop poles are, and you see what you need to do with them. And so initially, if just a, a, a proportional feedback K is enough, or if you need some perhaps lead compensation to swing the locus into the left half plane. And so you can do your initial uh, controller design um, in, the, uh, in the root locus uh, plot and, and you can get stability here and you can verify that uh, you're in the right ballpark by taking a look at the second order uh, design guides that we have for, for the poles in the S plane. Uh, but again, as you have more complicated systems that have extra closed loop poles, uh, these design guides become more and more inaccurate. Um, and so then as we do our controller tuning, we shift to our attention to the Bode plot of L of S. And so L of S um, is the transfer function uh, just along the top wire here. Um, and so we often call this the open loop Bode plot. So the Bode plot um, as if you weren't uh, closing this connection here uh, and just along the top wire. Um, and so sometimes it's called the open loop Bode plot, but more often it's just called the Bode plot that you use for control design because most of your work is done in this Bode plot. Um, and then the Bode, pl Bode plot of T that you're using as a final check and the, the step response of T, these are just final checks that you do at the end to make sure that everything's okay. If it's not, you come back and you tune this uh, a little bit more. And again, your tuning in here uh, takes into account um, the the, uh, the desired crossover frequency, um, and uh, so you adjust the entire system around that. Um, and so if you're given a rise time constraint, that gives you an idea of where you want to put that crossover frequency. There are a couple other um, uh, design guides that we have here in the uh, in, in the Bode plot that are useful. So if somebody gives you a bandwidth constraint, the bandwidth constraint over 1.4 uh, is about the place to put the uh, the crossover frequency in order to achieve that bandwidth constraint. And so that again, if instead of a rise time constraint, if somebody gives you a bandwidth constraint, or if they give you both, whichever of these uh, is most restrictive, um, we get an idea of where our crossover frequency should be in order to uh, achieve the uh, the, the closely response that we're looking for. And uh, finally, if uh, somebody gives you an overshoot constraint, we got an idea up here of the angle that we wanted the dominant second order poles if the system was dominated by a second order response. Um, uh, from the from the overshoot constraint, as we discussed before. But again, as your system be, uh, gets more and more poles, these uh, um, second order design guides become less and less accurate. And instead, uh, what we can uh, do is we can choose a zeta that's about the phase margin over 100 and use that value of zeta. Um, and so if somebody tells me uh, that uh, they want the overshoot restricted to 15%, then I say, okay, that corresponds to zeta of, uh, of about 0.5. In other words, I want about 50 degrees of phase margin, so I want this bump up in phase to be 50 degrees. And so that's the, the final piece that uh, as I'm tuning the lead compensation, and generally I'll center this bump in the lead compensation um, at the, the frequency that matters, the frequency where ultimately I'm going to tune to get crossover. Um, I'll put the lead compensator there, lag compensator over here, low pass filtering over there, adjust the entire gain to get the crossover frequency at the target crossover frequency. Frequency. I'll plot my closed loop step response and our, my closed loop body plot and I'll check and make sure everything's okay. And if it's not, I'll come back here and tune uh, according to the trends that these uh, design guides show um, in order to get the response I'm looking for. So you start off with the specifications on the problem um, and you say, okay, that's the target I'm going to shoot for. Where should I, uh, how should I get stability and what gets me in the ballpark there? Then you do most of your work here, back and forth between here and here and here and you're done. That's how you do the process of classical control design. There's one final piece in all of this, is that I can only draw the root locus plot if I have a model of G of S. And so oftentimes, 
uh, we're, we're engineers, uh, we will take a look at our system and model its dynamics, and so we will be able to get a good model of G of S, and so that's quite valuable when we use it. Sometimes you just have a black box, and all you can do is put a sinusoid into that black box and look at the magnitude and phase of the persistent sinusoidal component of the output of that box. So all you can do is draw this Bode plot um, as, a, uh, as a function of frequency, initially for the plant, uh, and then ultimately you're going to apply the controller on top of it. And so then the, the question is, given just a Bode plot, can you address the question of stability? Well, that turns out to be very difficult just drawing the Bode plot. But if we take a Bode plot and plot it in polar coordinates, it becomes doable. And so we'll address this in a future uh, talk, but the alternative of the root locus plot that you can use to evaluate the question of stability when you don't have a model of G of S is called the Nyquist plot. And the Nyquist plot shouldn't be scary. The Nyquist plot is simply um, a, a, a Bode plot drawn in polar coordinates. And so if I take this magnitude, it's large for low frequencies and small for high frequencies. And so that's the magnitude, um, large for low frequencies and small for, for high frequencies. And so that's this curve parameterized by the frequency moving from here to here. And if we start off at a frequency way out here, which is like nearly minus 180 degrees, um, as we come up here, we get to a frequency which is closer to, um, I don't know, uh, not quite minus 90, but maybe minus uh, 130 or so. Um, and then we come back down here to um, a phase of minus 180 degrees. Uh, and then we even go uh, below that to, to a, a phase of minus 270 degrees or so as the magnitude keeps on getting smaller. This curve is exactly um, this curve. So this is magnitude and phase, and this is taking that magnitude and phase and drawing um, in polar coordinates. Um, and so then um, you can argue that this is for s is equal to i omega. For s is equal to minus i omega, um, we get the mirror image of that. And then as we examine the Nyquist plot, plot, we'll see that there's an argument that you can make about closing the contour. And whether or not this contour contains the minus 1 point, uh, we'll then be able to use to determine um, whether or not the closed loop system is stable without ever even drawing a locus plot. And so this is useful for determining stability when you can't draw a root locus plot. When you can draw a root locus plot, forget about it. You don't need that complication. You just use root locus, Bode plot, the final checks, iterate until you're done. That in a nutshell um, is how we do classical control design. Um, in, a, in a future lecture, um, we're going to examine each of these individual pieces, lead compensation, lag compensation, low pass filtering, how we put them together, um, certain other uh, situations where we can uh, uh, propose different controllers that we can tune in there um, and compare them to a perhaps more lazy approach is just to take D of S is equal to a proportional part, an integral part, and a derivative part. Um, and uh, we will see the uh, implications of that on a plot like this. And we'll see that this targeted approach called loop shaping um, is in a way much better because it gives us uh, more degrees of freedom on the, on the controller design. And so we can adjust the controller so we apply control just at the frequencies that we need it and not at other frequencies. And so we can uh, be much more careful and precise um, in, the, uh, in the action that we're doing with our, our Control-U. Um, okay, so uh, that'll be it until the next video. Thank you.